John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, there was a man, um, John chapter 3, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now, most of you know this, Nicodemus is a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews. It says he's a man of the Pharisees, which means that this guy has lived his life and has lived his adult life for sure, studying the Torah, memorizing the Torah, knowing the way of the rules of God, the way of God, knowing the details of God. He would know all the details of the offerings. He would know the meal offering, the grain offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, trespass, heave wave. He'd know every one of them. He'd know the minutia. He'd know the details. He'd know the, he would know all of this stuff. He's studied it day after day. He's well known. He's a ruler of the Jews. So he's not only just a Pharisee, a leader, he's a ruler of the Jews. He's well known. He's well regarded. He walks around with his triple doctorate in, in theology. He's, he's respected. And he comes, the scripture says, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So Nicodemus has a problem, and I'll tell you what his problem is. He's living out of his head. Nicodemus has studied the law so deeply, so long, so ardently, so, so passionately, he studied the law. He has studied how the Messiah is supposed to come, when he's supposed to come, what he's supposed to look like. He's, he's, he's ready, he knows, and yet Jesus doesn't fit his thinking. And so he's got this incongruity happening that here's the law, here's the Torah, I've studied it, I know it, and I've got this man out here who is doing miracles opening the eyes of the blind and setting captives free and doing these things, but he doesn't fit my box. I, I got him here. I got the word here. I, I don't get it. So Jesus answers to him. So this is the conflict he has. So the next line to, doesn't seem to make sense when Jesus answered him, but you'll answers him, but you'll get it when you see where, where Nicodemus is at. Jesus says, Truly, or most assuredly, verily, verily, I say to you, unless one is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. He can't see the kingdom. Now, we're not talking just about physical sight. We're talking about comprehension. He can't get it. He can't comprehend the kingdom of God unless he's born again. This is Nicodemus' problem. This is religion's problem. This is natural man's problem. This is smart man's problem. This is the atheist's problem. This is the problem with people who live inside, live out of their head. If they live completely out of their head, Christian things, spiritual things don't make sense to them. Because they look at it and they've got their box of understanding. And when they look at the gospel... You're going to tell me that a dead man, that a man died, he was dead three days, and the third day he rose again? Is that what you're telling me? It's exactly what I'm telling you. That doesn't make sense. You're telling me that a man lifted a rod, and the wind began to blow, and the waters began to part, and, and a million and a half people went through on dry ground from, from Egypt to, to the wilderness, went through there on, on dry ground because a man held his rod, and the wind began to blow? That's what you're telling me? That's what I'm telling you. That doesn't make sense. You're telling me that a snake talked to a woman in a garden and he convinced her to eat a forbidden fruit and that caused mankind to fall into sin? We say, yeah, that's what we're telling you. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit our box. It doesn't fit Nicodemus's box. It doesn't fit, it doesn't fit natural man's box. It doesn't. So Jesus said, unless you're born again, you can't see or comprehend the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus then answers, said, here he goes back into his head. How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time in his mother's womb and be born? Well, he knows that he can't do that. We all know he can't do that. But that's as far as his rationale will take him. That's as far as his intellect will get him. He can't get beyond where he's at because he's locked into a world where he lives out of his head. Because he lives out of his head, he has no ability to see into this other realm that Jesus is talking about. So Jesus goes on to say, most assuredly, I say to you, 
Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So Jesus tells us there are two births. One is flesh one is spirit. We could use the term natural. All of us sitting here were born. Hallelujah. You say, man, that guy's smart. <laughs> you got that figured out. Everyone sitting here has been born of water. We are born of flesh. But it may not be that all of us can comprehend the kingdom of heaven or see or understand the kingdom of God unless we're born again. So I'm going to talk to you about this this morning and I'm Hopefully not oversimplifying things, but I want to talk to you about it. And I'm going to put up a graph. In the natural, all of us have five senses. If you hit it again, I think that's supposed to spin. <laughs> now, the reason I want it to spin is because you know that your five senses are operating every second of your life. You don't even realize that while you're looking, you're listening, tasting, you're feeling, your socks are too tight, you're squirming around because the temperature is not just right for you, a little cool, a little warm, you're feeling, you've got the taste of coffee, you've got all of these things in the natural is going, your five senses, and they're always going. You're hearing a sound, that's a bird. You hear something, oh, that's a fire, and that's, that's an ambulance, and it's going away. It's getting, and, and you're processing all of that. You're hearing, tasting, seeing, all of these things are happening, and they're always happening just like this at all times. You are, got, you are listening, hearing, tasting, all of this is happening all the time. You're taking it in. This is the natural world. This is true of every human being. We can feel hot and cold. We can feel the wind. We got all these things going on. But then comes the, the other part of us. And that's what the Bible calls the soul, the suke, P-S-U-C-H-E. It's got where we psychiatry and psychology and, and psyched out. You messed with my mind, man. And, and, and the, the soulish realm of us has to take and process what the senses receive. The senses are information gatherers. That's all they are. They can't tell us anything. You see something, but then you have to take what you see, and in your soul, your intellect, you process it. You, you feel something about it emotionally. You, you decide something about it. And, and you hear a lot of people say that the three parts of soul, mind, will, and emotions. But there's two other parts that are very important in our lives that, that affect everything we do. That is our memories and our fantasies or imagination. Memories are past-based and fantasy or imagination is future-based. So because we're not static in the moment, we actually live at all times in an eternal perspective. We always live in a perspective of I'm connected to my past and I've got a future. So if I look at a tree... When I look at a tree, I begin to process. And depending on my memories, my background, my understanding, I might look at that tree, see that it's got blossoms on it. I am able to deduce from intellect and memory that it's an apple tree. And I can imagine that just in a few months, I'm going to see nice apples hanging on that tree. I can look at it and I can get all that information. And then when I see the apple, I think of apple pie, which takes me back to Thanksgiving when mom would make nice warm apple pie with some ice cream and so I can look at an apple tree and all of a sudden be transported back to Thanksgiving and I love my mom because I looked at an apple tree now not only do I have all these senses coming at me but they're supposed to all spin because you also have while you're getting senses you're also always feeling something thinking something remembering something imagining something and so all of these things are happening in your life all at the same time and you can see that the senses funnel into the soul so everything funnels into our soul that's why we are complex human beings and why the scripture says be patient with one another because not all of our cycles spin at the same speed. <laughs> so in all of these things, you mentioned words and they can evoke emotions and intellect and thoughts and all these things. We can just say words and, and move. But but so that but the thing to understand is all of this. And I think it's the next one. All of this is flesh or natural. 
Every human being on the planet has this operating to one degree or another. There are people or deaf people, but all have this same thing happening, and it's called the flesh world. Now, in the flesh world, the only thing that you have to draw from is the outside world. You only The only way you can get intellectual, the only way you can get learning is someone can teach it by hearing or you can look at it by reading. And even reading, you sight is just ink on a page, but then intellectually we're taught certain shapes form certain letters, certain letters form certain words, certain words some form certain sentences. And so we can look at ink on a page and come away with a thought. But that thought now is in the soulish realm, not, not in the, the external. It's, it's a thought. So I can read something and it can, it can move me, anger me, inform me, do all of those things. And every human being lives there. And because every human li being lives there, every human being learns to rely on this part of their life very heavily because that's all they have to draw from. That's all they've got to draw from. They only have intellect or emotion or memory or imagination to draw from. There are some people who are so strongly drawn or strongly led by their emotions that they're so emotionally that they say something like, I have a bad temper. No, you have learned how to control your environment with your anger. And so you have processed, things don't go my way. And since things don't go my way, I have found when I was little, I'd pitch a temper tantrum and mama would come along and say, oh, what can I do to make you happy? And so I learned that if I pitch a temper tantrum, then I started dating girls and I found a girl who would coddle my anger. Some girls kicked me to the curb so I didn't, those, those weren't my girls. And I'd find me a girl that when I'd get mad, she would bow down. And so now my anger is my control mechanism for my life. That's all I have to draw from. I, I draw from my anger. This is Nicodemus. Nicodemus lives in this world. He gets information. He's read the Torah. He knows the Torah. And as he's read the Torah, he's, this is his life. Now, to be born again means that we develop another aspect of our being. It is called spirit. I'm going to talk to you about it, but I'm going to introduce it to you. The spirit realm also has five senses. And if you hit it, I think we'll get funnels there. Yes. The spirit realm will now funnel information into your soul. But it doesn't come from the external world. It comes from the heavenly realm. And so heaven, now your spirit man has five senses. And so you can taste. So you'll go to that next slide and you'll see. Oh, I forgot. So now look at look at how complex we are because I'm getting feelings and, and things from the world. My senses are going, but my spirit's also going. You go into the grocery store and you're standing in line and you're just there minding your own business thinking, did I get the, everything I'm supposed to get? And all of a sudden you look at somebody and something in your spirit says she needs prayer. Yeah. You go, wait a minute, I, I'm, in, I'm in this world. And yet this world has just spoken. Mm -hmm. She needs prayer. And now I've got a word and information. Now I've got to turn that into my soul, my will, my intellect. How am I going to go and breach the, broach the subject with her or him? And how am I going to go pray with him? I've got something that came from my spirit. I don't know that it came from, it didn't come from the natural world. The next slide, I think, will show us Jesus is seated on the throne. God is on the throne of our life. We have accepted him. I'm going to finish at the end of getting that done. But... But God is sitting on the throne and you now are, he is now developing five spiritual senses. The first one, the sense of sound. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. You have to develop a listening ear. It is part of what you are if you're born again. But you have to develop it because remember that mix of information going in, it'll be very quiet compared to the outside. You've lived from the outside all your life. And so the outside is loud and it makes a lot of sense. The inside is quiet and isn't always, isn't always convenient to the intellect. And so that quiet, still voice has to be given pre given place in your life and obedience to it. Otherwise, you will become spiritually deaf. That's why the scriptures, he who has ears, let him hear. Develop your spiritual hearing. But you say, how will I know if I heard right? You've got to do what you heard. 
the citadel that God is after to capture in your life and every day and every moment of your life is your will. It is your will. The will, I, I couldn't figure a way to put that in the, in the, the, the graph, and so it's alongside of all the others, but the ruler is the will. Old Star Trek got it. Captain Kirk was the will. Spock was the intellect. Dr. McCoy was the emotions. And so Kirk had to get information from one and from the other. Doc, go to Jim. You better land this thing. We're all going to die. And Spock would say, this is not logical, Captain. We must contain. And, and, so, and so Captain Kirk has to decide, do I listen to intellect? Do I listen to emotions? And so he's got this. It's, that's, that is a picture of our will. What do I listen to? What will I choose based on what I'm listening? Will I listen to my reasoning? And so God comes along, intellect says, you know, get all you can, can all you get. And, and, and God comes along and says, God loves a cheerful giver, a generous giver. God says, if you give, I will, you will receive good measure, pressed down, shaken together, overflowing. And so the spirit realm says, give it away and it'll come back to you. The natural realm says, save it up and don't give it to anybody. Now we've got two competing worldviews and two competing thoughts that are mixing into this piston that's going around between emotions and will and senses and money and should I give it or should I not give it? And it's my last five dollars and should I? What am I going to do? No wonder we're all psychotic. <laughs> and so we start learning to listen to the voice of the Spirit when He says, and we 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 say it, but we really mean it. Give as the Lord tells you to give. Because he will speak, and the problem is we don't want to listen because he's oftentimes going to tell us to give more than we wanted to give. Because in the natural realm, we give according to reason. In the spirit realm, we give according to faith. And sometimes that scares us, and we'd rather be in the boat with the other disciples hanging on while Peter's out there sucking water. We'll let him go take all the chances. That wasn't in my notes. Number two. <laughs> Taste and see that the Lord is good. Yes. Taste and see that the Lord is good. In the Old Testament, one of the one of the, is honey. The, the word is related to honey. Why? Because it tastes so good. Jeremiah said, I tasted it and it was sweet to my mouth and bitter to my tummy. It was hard word. I ministered a hard word a couple of weeks ago. And it was it was a hard word, but it's necessary. Taste and see that the Lord is good. So develop your spiritual taste. Number three is um, is Second Corinthians one four. He comforts us in all our afflictions with the uh, um, so that we may be able to comfort uh, those who are in any kind of affliction. This is the feeling, the peace God can bring a calm, a peace. If you've experienced it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you haven't experienced it, I can't explain it to you because it's in the spirit realm, not in the natural realm. But it just all of a sudden comes from the presence of the throne and God speaks a word, peace, and that hits your spirit. And your spirit just says, I'm taking over here right now. Everybody shut up. And your soul just goes, oh, thank you. Even your intellect, your mind is like, thank you so much. Your emotions are like, oh man, hallelujah. I was trying to figure this whole thing out. Now I'm stressing. Peace. It is your spirit. Then, then comes your, the smell. And, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. An offering and a sacrifice to God for, for a sweet smelling aroma. There is, the, there is a spiritual sensing of the, there's a sensing in the spirit that we liken to smell. I've had this a few times, the sweet perfume of people who love Jesus. I've also smelled body odor, spiritual, spiritual um, stink. I don't know a better word. I was, looking for, I was looking for, I was trying, I was trying. I couldn't find a word. But, but you, you know, in prayer lines and stuff and ministering to people, you, you go to lay hands on them and all of a sudden you get something, your spirit smells something. You can't see intellectually. They look like a good Christian. Emotionally, they're saying the right. You're hearing the right words. Everything from the outside looks right. But your spirit all of a sudden goes, we got some stank here. 
And so, so your spirit now is giving you information that you're not getting on the outside. Now, of course, you need to develop your spiritual intellect to say, what do I do? You need a word. What do I do with the fact that I know this is in the Holy Spirit's very faithful. He's gentle, compassionate, tender, kind, and loving. And, and he will help us bathe people in the spirit and help them get washed. So, but you have to be able to discern it. Now, every one of you, these are not spiritual gifts. This is your spiritual man. Spiritual gifts is for another time. This is your spiritual man who is being developed in all these five senses. And the fifth sense is sight. Not in this order, just all of them. And, and it is while we don't look at the things which are seen, things which are not seen. The things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So Stephen is being stoned to death, and he looks up and he says, I see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of glory. Yeah. Standing on the right. Thank you. Standing on the right. I see. I, Stephen, what are you looking at? I have left this world and I'm looking into that world and I am seeing. Jer Isaiah was all freaked out. King Uzziah had died. Everything's going to hell in a handbasket. And all of a sudden he says, I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Spiritual sight. God will develop your spiritual sight, your spiritual, and you now are aware, if you weren't, are aware to let these things be developed in you. Now, you develop these things by the word of God. Let me move on to the next thing. Now, what is the connecting point that brings my spirit man to life and activity? So it's not just life, it's life and activity, and it's this word. It's belief. You see, the natural man lives by intellect, reason, emotion. The spiritual man lives by faith. He believes what the spirit world is telling him. He has to trust that realm. He has to believe that world. He doesn't have the he doesn't have anything from the external sources that can reinforce. What God is saying, he has to take God's word for what God says. And if he doesn't take God's word for it, he can't see the kingdom of heaven. He can't move in that realm because unless a man is born again, he can't see the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is closed book to him because he doesn't believe. And if he doesn't believe, he won't see. And so there are people who say, I'll believe it when I see it. And this kingdom says you'll see it when you believe it. You believe it. And so we speak to your ears. That's coming in the natural ear. The preacher is preaching. You must be born again. But when the preacher preaches, you must be born again. In your intellect, you say, like Nicodemus, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter his mother's womb and be born a second time? But that spirit inside of you says, I get it. Your spirit says, I get it. And your will says, and we say, will you, will you, soulish part, will you give your life to Jesus Christ? Will you lay it down at the altar? Will you become a disciple and a follower of Jesus? Will you count everything as lost that you might win him? And something inside of you begins to churn. And that part of you that was disconnected and confused, you felt no peace, you felt no purpose, you felt no power. Something inside of you is like, is this all there is? Nothing seems to make sense. All of a sudden, that word begins to light up inside of you, and it speaks to you and says, do it, man. Do it. And you do it. You lift your hand. You go to the altar. You pray the prayer. And you say, yes, Lord, I give you my life. Yes, Lord, I make you my Lord. Yes, Lord, I will follow you. And when you walk away, you don't even realize that planted inside of you is a new being, that new part of you in the seed form. It hasn't been developed. It will mature. But you are now born again. You now have a connecting point to heaven. You have an umbilical cord through which all of heaven's strength, heaven wisdom, heaven's power can flow into your being because you were born again. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Now, all of the external activities and actions and behaviors that you had are not immediately gone. You've lived in the world. So you've got things in your life that now do not, not 
reflect the kingdom of God inside of you do not reflect the kingdom of God. You've got behaviors and attitudes uh, and habits and things. And so what God is going to begin to do is he's going to feed your spirit. As he feeds your spirit, your spirit gets larger. As your spirit gets larger, like a baby in the womb beginning to kick, the baby begins to kick against stuff that doesn't fit his environment, her environment. It begins to kick against the stuff you're doing. And the Holy Spirit comes and knocks on the door of your heart and says, you know that? You've done it for a long time. I know you have, but now it's time to quit. And the external starts to begin to match the internal. That's what we call integrity. Integrity just means all one. Duplicity, meaning two. Hypocrite, play actor, that's the guy who says, I, I, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on television. <laughs> and so there are people, we talked about this on Wednesday night, there are people who will go up to him on the street and say, hey, doc, I got this thing on my elbow. And he's like, uh, I'm an actor. I'm not a doctor. But I've been so convincing at my job that you think I'm an actor, that I'm a doctor. And that's what a hypocrite is. A hypocrite is one who acts so much like a Christian. He cons people into thinking that he's a Christian, but he doesn't know God at all. He's play acting. Now, most of us are not play actors. Most of us just have flesh that needs to be overcome. It's not that I don't love Jesus. It's not that I'm not born again, but I got issues. and You got them too. And God's knocking on the door of my heart and he's cleaning things up. And then, then when he cleans the external stuff up, you can look at the pastor and say, man, that pastor, he's a man of God. He doesn't do this. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do this. And yet I'm on my face calling out before God because the Holy Spirit's Amen. speaking to me saying, you don't love like I love. And I'm convicted and I'm saying, God, I've got to love people and I can't in my natural. The same way I tried to quit behaviors and I couldn't and I call on God and I fought and I wrestled. The same way God says, love them. I say, I can't love them. I'm trying to love them. But if I act like I love them, now I'm playing the hypocrite because I don't really love them. You and I know, Lord, the, the truth. I don't really love them. Now, just as a side note, I'll take a rabbit trail, which gets us into long services. But... Um, but there is a passage in Ezekiel chapter 44. I had this discussion with someone recently, a minister recently. It's Ezekiel chapter 44. And it tells the minister that when he's out before the people, he's to wear wool. And when he goes, when he goes into the presence of the Lord, he's to take the wool off and he's to wear linen. And it's a picture of you don't show, your, you don't show people your stuff. So it's not hypocrisy. It's just not your business. I'm going to say that again. It's not hypocrisy. It's just not your business. The stuff that God's dealing with inside of me, I'm not telling you. I told you about the love thing, but y'all have that problem too. So, <laughs> But whatever things before you, it's not play acting now. It's wearing wool because not everything, we don't give and share everything we have with everyone. Everyone in here is doing the right thing. You're wearing clothes. You know why? Because if you didn't, it'd be gross. <laughs> So we wear clothes. I'm not wearing clothes for me. I'm wearing clothes for you. <laughs> it's like the mask thing. <laughs> yeah. And everybody says, thank you. Very, thank you. Very, my wife is like, yes, thank you. <laughs> so God is working and cleansing. Now the spirit man is being developed and he's beginning to grow, but he only operates through faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Everything in the kingdom is by faith. Everything in the kingdom is by faith. Everything in the kingdom is by faith. If you try to live this thing out, you can go along and say, Lord, I got to figure it out now. I'm going to do it. That's what the Galatians were doing. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? You, you, you started in the spirit. Now you're going to finish in, the, in works. You, you think you're going to figure it out? And we all have gone through this as we matured where we've tried to do Christianity. Right. I'm going to be a better person. We've made our promises. I'm going to be better. I'm going to do better. And it's appropriate to, to before the Lord. But then but then we fall miserably and we go back and say, God, I'm a miserable wretch. Years ago, we had a, amazing grace. How sweet the sound of saved a wretch like me. And there was a songbook that took the word wretch out and changed it to save someone like me because it's a negative confession to say wretch. And it's just it's beating up on yourself, just not healthy to beat, to beat up on yourself. And I would say to you, show me someone that doesn't know their wretchedness, and I'll show you someone that's never seen God. Because wretch is an apt word when you get in the presence of the Lord. 
around y'all, wretch might not be the word, but in his presence, wretch is the word. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound saved a wretch like me. That doesn't hurt my self-esteem. That it's just reality. In my in my myself in his presence, I vanish. I am a mess. I'm a wretch. So everything is coming now by faith. Everything God is doing in your life is by faith. Every act, every work, he wants you to do it by faith. You feed the hungry, do it by faith. You clothe the naked, you do it by faith. You go in off a prayer, you do it by faith. All of the works that come out of belief come because you believe. I am a believer, therefore I work. Everything I'm doing by faith. So look at these passages of scripture. Um, and now we finish it and we'll finish up. Go back to, in your Bible, John chapter 3, if you have your Bible right there, and notice how many times the word believe will show up in these next few verses. In verse 12, Jesus says to Nicodemus, if I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? I'm telling you a simple thing and you don't believe it. How are you going to get to the deeper things? And this is the key to all deep knowledge in God. You have to believe it. This is the key to all knowledge in God. You have to believe it. Nicodemus, you can't get out of your box. You can't get out of your head. You won't ever see the kingdom of heaven. And we've tried to make it easy on you by telling you earthly things, and you don't even get it. You don't believe it. How am I going to be able to tell you heavenly things? He goes on to verse 15. As we know a passage, whoever believes in him should not perish, but have ever have eternal life. We say this verse so many times. And of course, John 3, 16 follows that one that says God so loved the world that he gave his only son to whoever believes in him. We say it so often and so much that we, it, we may, it may lose its potency. Amen. That this word belief is the crux of all spiritual life. It is the foundation for all life. If you want to work miracles, you got to believe. If you want to lay hands on the sick and see him recover, you got to believe. If you want an anointing that sets captives free, if you want to talk to people about Jesus, if you want to see souls saved, you've got to believe. It all comes out of that core of belief. It, it comes from belief. You've got to believe, which, which is why the man said, Lord, help my unbelief. I don't think it's, an, I th think it's a bad prayer. Sometimes it's like, Lord, this, my intellect is way too strong for me right now, and I cannot figure out. I know I'm living in the flesh world. I'm living in that intellect world. I can't figure out how you're going to get me out of this mess. I can't figure out how you're going to do this. So I saw a Facebook post of a friend who said um, who said that their son was supposed to get into Liberty College and they were really just kind of relaxed about it because they were just sure that he was going to get a scholarship. He had good grades, good kid, God, you know, and just I just knew he's going to get a scholarship and he's going to go to Liberty. And uh, and he said uh, the paper came back and said the scholarship has been denied. And, and he says, oh, no, we got to start looking at other schools. And his wife said to him, only believe. He, he's going to liberty. God will make a way. And he's telling in, his, in this article on Facebook how now, you know, he feels like a heel that, that he, you know, went to the natural realm and, and everything. And so sometime later, and I don't know the time frame, but sometime later, they got a letter that there was a special type of scholarship that the son had received full right. To, wow. to and the point of his Facebook was saying, my wife believed, but I started looking for other schools. I start saying, what if, what if, what if? This is just all of us, natural. We revert to the natural realm and our spirit man. So she stayed strong in spirit, believes, whoever believes. Goes on to say, verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Notice that there's not a thing about works here. Not a thing about good. He, if he's a good guy, he gets to go to heaven. If he's a moral guy, he gets to go to heaven. If he's, you know, if he gives money to the poor, if he goes and builds orphanages, if he digs wells, if he does mission work, if he what well, there's not a thing about any of that. It all goes back to this. This is the tripping, the stumbling block that God has set up that causes the world to stumble. He said it's so low. He said it's so, he said it's so easy 
that the wise trip over it. He made it so low that the wise can't get down to it. The strong can't, can't figure it out. He made it so low that it takes somebody like you and I who just say, you mean that's all there is? I don't have to give a lot of money. I don't have to be an excellent athlete. I don't have to have a high IQ. You mean all I have to do is believe? All I have to do. I had a lady say to me one time, too simple. She said to me, you mean to tell me there's a white hat God who gives me eternal life if I believe and there's a black hat devil who's trying to make me not believe and if I follow black hat devil, I'll go to hell and the white hat God, I'll go to heaven. And I said, basically, she said, she was driving and she wagged her finger. She said, too simple. Now, I was not a, not a minute in the ministry at the time and I didn't have any answer for her. So I sat there silently. But I would have responded to her at this time. I would respond to her, say, God made it that way to trip you up. God made it so that it would trip you up. So who gets in? The poor, the meek, the poor of this world. They get in. Look around. You see your calling, brother. Not many, many mighty, not many noble. Why? Because God made it so low that they can't get down to it. It is believe and then John then John the Baptist finishes it up at the end of the chapter he who believes in the son has everlasting life and he who does not believe the son will not see life but the wrath of God abides on him so here's the picture I've got the outside world of sense I've got the soulish world of of um, interpreting sense and I've got the internal world that I live in faith I believe by believing it develops my sight my taste my sound my sound it develops my spirit man and as I go back before the Lord faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of God how did my faith get strengthened by the word of God I read the stories I tell the stories I imagine the stories I to move in the soulish realm and I become a, a director and producer of a movie and I tear, take myself and I, I find myself at the grindstone with Samson as his hair is beginning to grow. And as I see his hair growing and he's treading around the mill and I'm imagining as he's growing, no one's noticing his hairs get a little longer. And you come back a few weeks later and you're looking at Samson and he's still grinding around the wheel, but the hair is growing and his hair's a little longer. Boy, Samson, your hair's getting little. Nobody's noticing because that's a picture of the anointing that is returning on his life. Don't worry, Samson, the anointing's coming back. Keep grinding, son. Keep grinding, son. And I read that story and I imagine that story and I tell myself that story until I'm so filled with faith that I could tear down a temple. Yeah. Hallelujah. So let's conclude. Where are you? And what are you living out of? Are you living out of your head? Are you like Nicodemus? You may be very religious. You may know a lot of Bible. Maybe you have a quote scripture. But you're living out of your head. Everything's natural. Everything's natural. Everything's natural. You try to figure everything out. And you live in the natural. Then you pray to a spiritual God. But your faith level is. But your faith is really not in a God who does the supernatural. Your faith is really in your own self. And your ability to connive and think through. And, and cut through. And you, God you got to help me. God you just got to help me. It's not wrong. God you got to help me. But then there comes a point when you say. You know what? I need a word from God. On this matter. I need to lock myself in my closet. I need to get along with the word. I need to get along with my thoughts. I need to get along with my spirit. And I need to get there until the Holy Spirit breathes a word into me and I heard it. Or gives me a picture in my spiritual imagination and I saw it. And all of a sudden I walk out and I say, hey, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. You don't understand. Everything's going to be fine. Why? The Apostle Paul got that when he was on the ship. Comes out and says, hey guys, chill. I heard from God. Had an angel came and showed up. Told me that we're all going to make it. We're going to lose the ship, but not a soul will perish. Where did he get that from? Spirit realm. 
spirit realm spoke into natural realm and brought a great calm, at least for Paul. I don't know if the men were really pleased about it, but at least for Paul, he's like, hey, we're going to make it. Paul knew he had a destiny. He knew he had to preach. He knew God's hand was on him. It's like, this storm can't kill me because I have a responsibility, and I already know I got I to gotta preach in Italy and Rome. So I'm not dying now. This is not my time. So whatever you're dealing with in your life, I'm encouraging you to look at it and ask yourself, where am I living? What am I living out of? How much of this is soulish in me? If you're seeing the evidences of soul, fear, anxiety, depression, all of those things, that's the, the soulish realm that's been from the external, from the memories, from the imagination. Well, here's what we do. Um, you know, it's like I, I, I got a call and, I, and I'm not going to be able to get that check in the mail that they said was coming. So I now take my imagination and I see, I get fear, and I see myself sitting on skid row with a tin pot asking for alms because that money wasn't coming. And it works on my emotions and now I'm fearful, I'm anxious, I'm snappy, I'm irritable, all of these things. That's working in my emotional realm. So what's the problem? Well, you don't understand. That's easy for you to say. You've got money, but I was just told my check's not coming. And so you've lived yourself, you've thought yourself, you imagined yourself into a realm of anxiety and God says this doesn't reflect me and this is not my kingdom so you pray every morning Lord your kingdom come your will be done on earth this piece of earth first as it is in heaven then he says well if that's the case then you got to learn how to live at peace when the check isn't coming so I got to go into my spirit and I got to get a word from God and God comes along and says hey Son, chill, go outside and do what? Do what I tell you one step at a time. Do what I told you to do, go outside. So you go outside. He says, now look at the birds. And you look at the birds. He says, you know what? Not one of them are dying of a heart attack from stress, wondering where the next meal is coming from. I feed them. I care more about you than I care about the birds. You're of more value than many sparrows. Hey, look at the flowers. This is the time of year. And we're still, our dogwoods are still in bloom. And those dogwoods are there saying, it was a long winter. <laughs> but spring is here. He says, look at those dogwoods. I took care of them. I clothed them, didn't I? Stand with me this morning, please.